Uh, so give us a sense of exactly where you are in this process. We heard from Alex Gorski earlier, you were going to try to start these phase three in September. It looks like you made it. What's the process from here? Well, we made it. Uh, it's mid-September. Um, and we announced yesterday that we are going to recruit 60,000 uh, people in this study. The study will be run uh, mainly in the US, but also in South America, in six countries, as well in South Africa, to, to, to recruit a diverse uh, people, um, both young and old, we, uh, it, and as well as diversity in African-Americans, Latino, and the different people who are at risk. Um, what's very special, I think, is that this is a single dose vaccine. We have been able to show through our research and through our preclinical and clinical testing earlier that the single dose uh, will be sufficient to protect people. And so we are going to study the single dose in this large clinical trial in the next few months. Mm -hmm. uh, doctor, you mentioned the elderly as well as African Americans, Hispanics who have been disproportionately affected by the coronavirus. As you put together your group of volunteers, do you take that into account? Do you over index, as it were, for some of the people who are most vulnerable? Yes, we are doing that. And we have been working over the past months with uh, epidemiologists and data science to find out where in the US are, can we find regions of very high transmission, but also population groups which are uh, over-indexed on, on African-American, Latino, and, uh, and, and elderly. So to make sure that the risk groups are, are very well representative in safety and, and efficacy study. Now, your approach is a bit different from some others, as I understand it. And I'm not a scientist, but as I understand it, working with Harvard, you have something that is a, a version of a cold virus that's adjusted somehow. What advantages does that give to you? For example, is it difficult to store this vaccine in success? So oh, we have been working on this for 10 years. We have done several vaccines. Our Ebola vaccine is now being deployed in Africa. Um, in, uh, we are doing a study, we are doing an evaluation in over 200,000 people. Um, and that's a, it has been approved by EMA. So it's a cold factor which carries um, a piece of the genetic material of, of, um, of COVID. And then the body produces the protein of the spike protein, which then generate immunity. It is, it is stable at two to eight Celsius for three months. It can be uh, stay, kept up for a long time at minus 20. So it is a way to transport it to the distribution sites at minus 20, then go into the field, into the vaccination sites at two to eight. So it's a single dose, simple to transport, and hopefully available on a very large scale. What's also important is that this is counted to be effective starting 15 days after the first injections. And that's very important for the pandemic because that, that protects you almost immediately. While if you have a boosted dose, then you need to wait six weeks before it starts to be effective. And when you have an outbreak somewhere, you want to be able to protect people fast. So. Um, single dose, fast protection, and easy to distribute. Now, President Trump has talked repeatedly about how fast he wants to have this vaccine. Do you have any sense of the timeline about how long it will take to know whether it is effective as well as safe or not? Or is that itself unpredictable? Well, it, it, it's unpredictable, but of course, doing 60,000 people and we will recruit them fast. We are very well set up with more than 200 sites in the world. We will be able to recruit people, but we have our own values also in what we want to see. We want to first uh, absolutely learn whether it's effect efficacious, but also whether it's safe. And we will not stop the study until we have enough safety data to be sure ourselves uh, to then talk with the regulators to be able to be uh, using it in emergency use. So we predict that that could be around the year end, early next year. We are now mid-September. Uh, four or five months would be the timing for getting to that point where emergency use could be possible. Well, talk about emergency use, because it's very much in the news these days. It was just yesterday with the president of the United States referring to it. What does that mean, emergency use? I'm told the FDA is about to come out with final regulations on that. The president says he's not sure he's going to abide by them. What do those regulations look like? Well, in... I don't know yet, but emergency use is, is a rule where the U.S. government can determine at what point through FDA and CDC can determine to, to use a product earlier than approval. Uh, we have done that in the past with HIV. We do that sometimes with cancer medicines. And here, because of the pandemic and the emergency, the government could use that, that, uh, that uh, possibility to do an emergency use. Uh, it's again, it has to be strict criteria 
because um, we first want to make sure that it's safe and effective as this will be deployed on a very large scale with very many people. So uh, we'll wait for that outcome of what the FDA will come forward with and further uh, requirements. Uh, but we have also our own requirements which we'll put on the vaccine before we release it. Mm -hmm. So that's a very important point. I mean, there's a lot of dispute right now about whether politics may or may not be entering into the FDA approval process. But you're saying Johnson & Johnson will not go forward if you're not satisfied, no matter what the FDA says. That's correct. And in, in the end, it's also our responsibility that when we come forward with the proposal for emergency use, or when the FDA or the CDC or, or NIH will ask that, or the government will ask it, that uh, that uh, that we will be ready to uh, to proceed with that. So it's a government, but it's also a company uh, a company decision. This is something all of us are following very very closely. Obviously, we're eager to have that vaccine, provided it's effective, provided it's safe. What is the sort of delay period between, on the one hand, emergency use approval and actual approval for mass distribution? Because most of us want to know when can we go into our doctor or our local clinic and get a vaccine. What's that delay? What's the time period? Well, emergency use could expand to, to very extensive vaccination. So um, I think it's more the comfort that uh, the FDA and the government will have with the safety, but also the availability of the vaccines. I think the first objective is here to vaccinate the highest risk people, which are the elderly, the healthcare workers, and the people with, uh, with comorbidities. And then uh, that will curb the mortality of the disease very quickly, hopefully, and then going to the broader population. So emergency use could be used in the whole population, but that's a decision of the government. Mm. So, so, Doctor, finally, uh, when we talked to Alex Gorski, your CEO, a couple of months ago, he said that actually Johnson Johnson would be preparing for mass production of a vaccine, even as the testing is going on. Obviously, you're not producing the vaccine itself, but are you prepared to go wide when and if you get the approval? Yeah, we are, at the moment, we are upscaling already. The first batches are in manufacturing, um, and uh, we will be ready to uh, to deploy early next year. Um, we will have at least 1 billion vaccines available in the course of next year. Um, we are gearing up more manufacturing in Europe, in the, in the US, but also in India, to make sure that also we can deploy globally, um, as it is a global pandemic. Um, and so, we will further upscale to reach as many people as possible because hopefully a vaccine can put a stop to the pandemic.